Oh Home Brewed Christianity listeners, this is Trip. And on the podcast today, we're going to talk to Jeffrey Robbins about the end of religion, question mark, and four very important theses on the radical theology of the future. But first, let me tell you that you're listening to the Homebrewed Christianity Podcast, the number one source for audiological, theological ingredients for you to brew your own faith. That's right. We don't want to think for you. We want to think with you. We want to bring you the best ingredients from a diversity of perspectives. And then you throw it in that fermentation chamber that is your imagination. And hopefully something zesty and tasty will come out. Today on the podcast, you get to hear from Jeffrey Robbins. That's right. Radical theologian extraordinaire is back on the podcast. And today he's talking about the end of religion. Uh huh. And he's also going to give you four theses on the future of radical theology. And this is the first of four, count them, different talks that were given at the conference in the religion at Villanova University that it feature, you know, Jeffrey Robbins, Jack Caputo, Merrill Westfall, and Aaron Simmons. Today, you hear from Mr. Robbins. And then you'll, you'll hear the others over the next week and a half or so. And then uh, Greg Horton, who stepped up and filled in for me at this End of Religion conference. That's right, Greg Horton. Not just an ex-pastor, not just a journalist, not just a wine connoisseur, but uh, he pinched hit for trip at this conference because I was trying to get a job then. But I also didn't want to let Jack down because if, if Jack Caputo wants you to be somewhere, yeah, J.C., Jack Caputo, if J.C. says come... You gotta come. You gotta put your put your hand to the plow. You don't look back. But if you're unemployed and you're trying to get a job, then you say, "Look, look, JC, um, I, I'll send the best person I can think of, and that would be Greg Horton." So Greg Horton filled in for me, and he did a great job. Like even you know even when people said things about him and he didn't know didn't know the reports I got, they were nice. So anyway, I uh, hope you enjoy this conversation. Before we jump in, I want to give you a heads up, a headsy uppy about a few things happening over at Homebrewed Christianity. That's right. Uh, in the near future, if you're a disciple of Christ, I will be at the Disciples of Christ General Assembly later this month of July 2015. Um, there's going to be two, count them, doso, live podcast at the General Assembly. The 20th is sold out. The 21st, there are still tickets available. You should get them and, and, you know, and hook up with us. Also, I have been told by some deacons that we're going to have a little soiree, a little get together the afternoon, early evening of the 21st at a local brewery. So tell me if you're going to be there so we can all hang out. Also, uh, starting this week is the brand new high gravity class called Varieties of Postmodern Theologies. And in the class, we look at four different postmodern theologies. We're going to look at one that does a reconstruction of the notion of God in light of postmodernity, a constructive postmodernism that leads with uh, philosophy, a theopoetics, and then a hermeneutical style. Anyway, if you would like to join this class, then there are two ways. One, you can just head on over to Homebrew. Click through, make sure you sign up, register and such, or you can be a member of the Homebrewed Christianity community and just go to homebrewedcommunity.com or click through on the website on the post for this podcast and you become an elder or a, or a bishop and you get to be a member of every high gravity class for Frizzy or it's a perk of donating monthly to keep this stuff coming to the thousands of people who enjoy this audiological theological goodness. Anyway, we love the homebrewed Christianity community and everyone who sponsors, supports the podcast, and you have access to high-gravity classes. You also are the exclusive people who get access to the Epic Reads class. Starting in September, Philip Clayton and I are going to do a year-long journey through some epic books. That's right. We're going to start off with Jürgen Moltmann's Crucified God. We'll do a little intro to Moltmann in September, October, talk through, walk through, teach through the book. And then in November, he's going to be on a live video streaming podcast of homebrewed Christianity that you'll have access to. And <laughs> we're going to talk about the crucified God with your Gamalmod. Yes. Then we're going to talk about John Sabrino's Jesus the Liberator. Then we're going to talk about Plato's Republic, Augustine's City of God. 
uh, Elizabeth Johnson, She Who Is, and Alfred North Whitehead's Religion in the Making, all this year in the Epic Read series for the people who are members of the Homebrewed Christianity community. Um, anyway, uh, right now, uh, feel free to join. If you have questions, holla, holla, holla. And thank you for all of you who have done so. Um, before we jump in, I just want to say one more thing, and that is that yours truly has a book that's coming out in November. It's called Jesus, Lord, Liar, Lunatic, or Just Freaking Awesome. It's coming out with Fortress Press, the first of the Homebrewed Christianity Guides series. And I like it because I wrote it, and it's about Jesus. So, I mean, I solidly agree with a good 60%. 16% of the book I wrote. Anyway, um, you can pre-order it on Amazon now. We're going to have a little uh, package and stuff when, um, you know, like coming up soon with like you can pre-order it and blah, 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 blah that kind of thing. But the most important thing is I wanted you to know that I'm putting together a little two-hour of the book. And here's the idea. I would come in some of the homebrewed Christianity um, uh, peeps, and we would go somewhere, do a live podcast. Like at some point during it, I'd do a spiel about the book. We'd also do like music, games. I'll get a different feature guest interview for each one. Maybe like a book release party slash live podcast at a place with wonderful craft beer and a lot of theology nerds. So if you are interested in hosting said um, book release live podcast thingy, my Bob, um, at the end of this year, or probably more January through March of next year, then let me know uh, because I, a number of you have already kind of reached out and I want to make sure to find the best ones. And, and, you know, hosting basically just means you kind of help connect dots and things since I don't live there. And you tell people about it. And then you come and we hang out. And if you have cornhole set, that like doubles your awesomeness. Because who doesn't want to play cornhole? Anyway, Jeffrey Robbins, <laughs> The End of Religion. And, uh, yeah, so uh, go to homebrewchristianity.com. Go to iTunes, Stitcher, subscribe, review it, tell your friends, share it. And uh, remember, remember, friends, remember, 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 the best theology is the stuff you do yourself. Mm -hmm. Then it sticks. Then it lingers. Then it matters to you. If it's just regurgitation, well, then it's just regurgitation. And who wants to chew theological cud? Crud. Chud. What is it that... Yeah, never mind. You know, like cows, they like eat something, chew their cud. They burp it up and chew it again. That's disgusting. Don't do that. So you should, you should, you should do theology for yourself. Peace. So I am going to talk about two things in my paper. Um, first, I'm going to address the theme of the symposium directly on the end of religion. And then I'm going to shift kind of midway through the paper and try to develop um, four theses on what I call radical theology of the future. So uh, first on the end of religion and then on what the future might hold and how radical theology might make a contribution to that future. But I begin with three quotes. First from Mark 2, 21 through 22 and 27. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak. Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it and the new from the old and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins, otherwise the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost in the skin as well. But one puts new wine into fresh wine skins. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. The second is from one of the parables of the Buddha. Monks, I will teach you the parable of the raft. For getting across, not for retaining. It is like a man who going on a journey sees a great stretch of water, the near bank with dangers and fears, the farther bank secure and without fears. But there is neither a boat for crossing over nor a bridge across. It occurs to him that to cross over from the perils of this bank to the security of the farther bank, he should fashion a raft and cross over to safety. When he has done this, it occurs to him that the raft has been very useful, and he wonders if he ought to take it with him on his head and shoulders. What do you think, monks, that the man is doing what should be done with the raft? 
They answered, No, Lord. What should that man do, monks? When he crossed over to the beyond, he must leave the raft and proceed on his journey. Monks, a man doing this would be doing what should be done with the raft. In this way, I have taught you Dharma, like the parable of the raft for getting across, not for retaining. You monks, by understanding the parable of the raft, must not cling to right states of mind and all the more to wrong states of mind. And then third, from the Apostle Paul, Romans 10, verse 4, For Christ is the telos of the law, so there might be righteousness for everyone who believes. Religion, at least as we know it, has ended many a time. Indeed, one could make the argument that the essence of religion, at least religion of a certain sort, is the ending of religion. Or put otherwise, the end of religion, as in its telos, or its goal, is the ending of religion. So Paul Tillich suggests when he identifies the Protestant principle and distinguishes it from historical Protestantism. The former is not and can never be exhausted by the latter. In Tillich's words, it, the Protestant principle, transcends any cultural form by containing the divine and human protest against any absolute claim made for a relative reality, even if this claim is made by a Protestant church. By virtue of the Protestant principle, Tillich had no qualms in announcing the end of the Protestant era, and with it, an end to the prevailing form of religiosity in the modern West. With the Protestant era at an end, Tillich held out hope for, quote, a new form of Christianity, to be expected and prepared for, but yet to be named. Never mere negation, the Protestant principle must be understood as protest and as creation driving towards radical transformations, end quote. Religion ends, and it is born again. But in declaring an end, you're identifying a purpose. Christ did not end the law, but fulfill it. Or which is it? Christ ended the law only insofar as the law was fulfilled. The law fulfills its purpose in Christ. The law's purpose is revealed in Christ. Christ reveals the law's purpose. Much is at stake in this question of the meaning of the end. Beyond the obvious concern over the potential for anti-Semitism within the heart of the New Testament gospel, the history of religions is replete with supersessionist claims, with each new religious iteration fashioning itself as the new and improved version thank you, of the old, rendering what once was obsolete, dead and buried. So Buddhism stands to Hinduism. So Christianity stands to Judaism. So Protestantism to Catholicism. Islam to the other Abrahamic faiths. To say that Muhammad is the last prophet is at once to commend and affirm what came before, the rich prophetic lineage of monotheism that stretches back to Adam through Abraham, Moses, and Jesus, among others. But it also marks a division and a finality. Unlike what came before, the will of God is now perfectly revealed, and thus the need for any further prophets now comes to an end. In this respect, religion comes to an end when it fulfills its purpose by completing and correcting what came before. After crossing to the other shore, why continue to shoulder the raft like the carcass of an albatross? Once religion has done its work, once it has fulfilled its purpose, why linger? If we are not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath for us, then doesn't that suggest that religion is but a means to an end? And if so, what would be wrong with the end of religion? Returning to Tillich's Protestant principle, I should be clear, I do not mean to be making any claims about religion in general, as if there is such a thing, nor about Christianity in general, as if there is such a thing. On the contrary, my own work emerges out of and takes as, its, takes as its point of departure a particular variant of Christian thought that takes as its raison d'etre a basic iconoclastic critical sensibility that goes so far as to disavow, if not repudiate, its own religiosity, if not its faith as such. For the sake of argument, call this the tradition of radical theology, which like most of its theological or philosophical predecessors, has had a tendency to get carried away by its own newness or novelty, to sharpen its divisions, and to emphasize discontinuity over continuity. And what follows, I want to suggest a way to reactivate a radical theology for the future, 
but not by severing its ties to the past, but by expanding them. This is an alternative strategy of disruption that builds on an underappreciation, underappreciated definition to deconstruction once offered by Derrida. Specifically, deconstruction is speaking multiple languages simultaneously. It is not about the absence of meaning, but the surplus. This has been the great lesson that Caputo has taught us about how Derridian deconstruction is fundamentally affirmative and the exigencies pose not so much as a result of critique and negation, but by virtue of saying yes to more than one thing at a time. With that said by way of introduction, let me return to my opening truism. Namely, religion as we know it has ended many a time. Consider the first few centuries in the making of what we would come to know as the Christian tradition. In these first few traditions, in these first few centuries, the nascent Jesus movement underwent a series of radical transformations. So radical, in fact, that not even the metaphor of death and rebirth do it justice. What comes to pass time and again with this series of endings is not a phoenix rising from the ashes, wholly intact and self-same, but something that is at once more, both more persistent and more disjunctive. A kind of refusal of death by which the living becomes something other than what it was. We may add, so not so much death and rebirth as much as a reversal and rein reinvention. We may add re regeneration as well. Catherine Malibu invokes the salamander as the apt image for the concept of plasticity with its capacity to regenerate lost body parts. <coughs> And so we may think of the historical making of the Christian tradition in plastic terms. Formations, deformations, and transformations. Or more graphically, of severed limbs and the refusal of death. Consider the four principal moments I have in mind. And these are familiar to you all. First, the delay of the parousia and the second coming of Christ. The first generation of Jesus' followers seemed to expect the imminent return of Christ with the delay of the second coming. There was a consequent shift in theology from being apocalyptic to the development of an ecclesiology. The Apostle Paul is a key figure in this moment of transition. And think of the example of his early writings and his later writings about sort of whether or not followers of Jesus should get married. In the early writings of the Apostle Paul, Jesus says, you don't have time to get married. Um, what you should be spending your time on is, is evangelizing, sort of spreading the gospel as many, as widely as possible, as much as possible. By the end of the Apostle Paul's life, he is now sort of giving specific instructions to people of the church about how they should organize themselves, how husbands should relate to wives. Um, so it's sort of order and sort of hierarchy of the church and the order and the hierarchy of the family. So you see, so Paul himself coming to terms with the reality of, of the delay of the parousia and how this sort of shifts his own attention. And so the real shift here, and, and, and probably exaggerating this on purpose, uh, is the shift from the coming of the kingdom of God, which was the message of Jesus, Jesus' own message, to the significance of Jesus as the Christ or the person of Jesus, the religion about Jesus. So this is the first transformation I have in mind. The religion of Jesus to the religion about Jesus. The second, familiar to you all, the destruction of the temple about a generation later, or ten years later. The Jewish political rebellion was stamped out by Rome with the consequent scattering of the Jewish community and the loss of the temple as its central place of worship and authority. This event widened the already growing divide between the Jews and the Jesus movement within Christianity or within Judaism. And this marks the beginning point of the real threat of persecution towards Christians. We might even say it marks the, really, the beginning point of Christianity as its own distinct and separate religion from Judaism. This is the second moment. The third moment, the Edict of Milan, 313, Constantine's conversion to Christianity, in quotes, 312, the Declaration of Toleration towards Christians throughout the Roman Empire. This transforms Christianity from being a persecuted sect within the empire to now being the favored religion of the empire, the alignment of Christianity with imperial power, from being the persecuted to now becoming the persecutors. This is the beginning of some Christian monasticism with a kind of withdrawal from this sort of worldly power 
of the church, and you also have the series of the ecumenical councils that are formed, convened for the purpose of uniting the empire by the means of this newfound imperial faith. So you have another radical transformation, a reinvention of Christianity as we know it. And then approximately 100 years later, the fall of Rome in 410, the earthly security provided by the empire was no longer assured. The church now has to step in and fill that vacuum of power. We have the beginnings here of the papal monarchy and the beginnings of the creation of a Christian culture and a Christian civilization that would endure for at least a thousand years, if not beyond. So in the first four centuries of the Christian movement or the Jesus movement or the Christian tradition, whatever we want to call it, we can point to at least four instances in which at least the nascent Jesus movement within Judaism and then later the religion of Christianity ends and begins again and again and again and again. Of course, we might say that this is a providential history, that the making of the historical church and the codification of the Orthodox creeds were all inspired by the Holy Spirit. Even still, we must nevertheless testify to God's work as a kind of creative destruction. We can go even further back and locate a beginning even before this beginning, in which there was a generation before the first generation of Jesus' followers expecting the imminent return of Christ. What I mean here, of course, is the time of Jesus himself and the treasure trove of findings from the generational scholarship on the so-called historical Jesus. These are dangerous waters here because, number one, I'm not a historian. I don't know what I'm talking about. And number two, I don't want to defend any kind of Christian supersessionism here. But isn't the reason why some early death of God theologians claim Jesus as the first first death of God theologian? It's sort of located in this sort of notion of sort of Jesus' own kind of reinvention and reimagining or sort of transformation of the faith as he knew it and as he received it. In the language of, of Levinas, we can say that of Jesus, that he announced the death of a certain kind of God. Jesus was born and died a Jew, of course. There was no such thing as Christianity during Jesus' lifetime. He was not himself a convert. He was not the first Christian. So this is not to suggest the old trope of Christianity somehow replacing Judaism, but instead something central and often neglected about death of, the, death of God theology is in this claim. Insofar as Jesus announced the end of a certain kind of religion and the death of a certain kind of God, he simultaneously announced the birth of something new, or better, the regeneration of something old. As we postmodernists have learned to say, the desire for God outlives the death of God. Credit Caputo. And now back from the past and into the present, while working backwards, it is possible to establish a line from the so-called nuns, those who increasingly identify themselves as spiritual but not religious, this is the sociological term, to Karl Barth and Dietrich Bonhoeffer by way of Kierkegaard and finally Martin Luther. A religionless Christianity that sounds an awful lot like Caputo's religion without religion. If such were the case, then we'd seem to have the answer to the question posed by the symposium. Faith in a postmodern age is a faith without at least a certain kind of religion. In the case of Bonhoeffer, it is without a certain kind of religion that confuses its faith with its cultural form. For Kierkegaard, it's a certain kind of religion that domesticates the radical demands of faith. For Luther, it, it has the stink of corruption, greed, and worldly excess. So we know that religions end. Even more, we know how theologians have understood their task to be the announcement of the end of religion. But if faith in the postmodern age means merely the replacement of religion with spirituality, wouldn't this be a kind of cheap grace that Bonhoeffer denounces in the cost of discipleship? If there is a line established from the nuns to Kierkegaard and Luther by way of Barth and Bonhoeffer, like my fellow panelists here or up there, (laughs) Westfall and Simmons, I too cannot help worry about what is lost. I believe the sociologist of religion, Oliver Roy, analyzes it best in his book, Holy Ignorance. Roy, who is an expert in contemporary Islam in the modern Middle East, but more broadly in the forces of globalization, shows how the culture of late capitalism functions as a breeding ground for neo-fundamentalist faiths. He makes it clear that this is not only a phenomenon within American Protestantism, but a global phenomenon impacting Islam, Judaism, and Hinduism as well. 
He identifies three factors in the contemporary transformation of religion. First, it begins with what he calls deterritorialization. De Easy for me to say. Deterritorialization. By which he means not only the movement of people, but the circulation of ideas, cultural objects, informations, and modes of consumption associated with the forces of globalization. Second, it includes deculturalization by which he means that in order to circulate, religious objects and ideas must appear universal and thus be disconnected from any specific culture. In this way, in an observation reminiscent to Stephen Prothero's argument from the book Religious Literacy, contemporary religion circulates outside of knowledge by the notion that salvation does not require people to know anything, but merely to believe. As Roy writes, quote, if religions are able to extend beyond their original cultures, it is because they have been able to deculturate themselves. The religious markers circulate without cultural markers, even if it means reconnecting with floating cultural markers. And he gives the example of halal fast food, eco-kosher, <laughs> cyber fatwa, Christian rock, transcendental meditation. This is the way by which these traditional religious terms have been deculturated and now fit within a kind of circulation of global consumption. And number three, the standardization of religion, which affirms two apparently mutually exclusive descriptions simultaneously. Number one, all religions are the same, and number two, all religions are different. Herein we can see the basic market logic at work, where the promotion, spread, and consequently self-understanding of religion is akin to product differentiation. But once religion is severed from culture and beliefs held irrespective of knowledge, this is a differentiation of differences that are superficial at best, a differentiation of differences without a difference. Multiculturalism, according to Roy, quote, boils down to obliterating cultural death and placing under the name of culture a reduced set of religious markers, all of which are similar to the other. The thesis is that, quote, fundamentalism is the religious form that is most suited to globalization because it accepts its own deculturalization and makes it the instrument of its claim to universality. So to return to my question posed, when I say that there's a line established from the nuns to Kierkegaard and Luther by way of Barth and Bonhoeffer and express concern over what is lost, I'm reminded of Tillich's Protestant principle. There is the protest, to be sure, and the relativization of any absolute claims by any historic faith or cultural form of religion. But consider the irony as well. A protest born in the challenge to restore the original purity and radical demands of the faith has established a near universal religious template by which an unlearned faith becomes little more than an identity marker that is only skin deep. By its standardization, it is capable of near infinite reproduction, a repetition without difference, no reformation, let alone regeneration, no change, but stagnation. What is forgotten or lost in this devolution of the Protestant principle is the creative element. This is where I invoke radical theology and probably where I part ways with Westfall and Simmons. As I inquire about what a radical theology of the future might look like, I am led to the question, what would it mean for theology to be neither reformational nor conservative, but instead transformational and radical? In order to do so, it need not represent itself as totally new or as a complete rupture, as death of God theology of the past has done. And it might get over the fixation on the finality of death and replace it with the image of the stubborn, regenerative life of the salamander instead. The mistake is to read radical theology exclusively in terms of the death of God movement. As I understand that radical theology is a post-liberal tradition of thought that emerges out of the death of God movement of the 1960s. But while it emerged out of the death of God movement, radical theology is not bound by it. As such, there are ways by which we might both mine and push against the limits of this tradition in order to envision a radical theology of the future that is capable of thinking what radical theology heretofore has left unthought. With that, I want to shift gears from the opening point regarding the end of religion in terms of Tillich's Protestant principle and turn towards the future by advancing four theses, theses for radical theology of change. So number one.
Radical theology is post-secular with a difference. Within the broad field of religious studies, there has been a reconsideration of the basic secularist assumption that has been operative throughout much of the history of the academic study of religion. Namely, the notion that the more modern we become, the less religious we would become. This was the subject of an interesting set of articles by Khaled Faruni and Natalia Omar in the most recent issue of the journal of the American Academy of Religion. Um, so-called secularization thesis was brought to question by scholars of religion long before the events of September 11. However, after September 11, these academic discussions became a much larger and more public dialogue and making some, such as the conservative political columnist, columnist David Brooks, to declare himself as a, quote, recovering secularist. As Brooks wrote in a column for the Atlantic Monthly in March 2003, the secularization thesis has proven to be yesterday's incorrect vision of the future. The secularist assumption is a residue of the ambiguous leg legacy of the Enlightenment. As the product of the Enlightenment, the very concept of religion harbors up not only an intellectual tradition that has domesticated religion by delimiting religion within the sphere of secular reason alone, but also one that has passed down its attitude of skepticism, if not outright hostility towards faith as a lesser form of knowledge and religion as exclusively either a matter of superstition or dogma. Correlatively, the anthropologist of religion, Talal Assad, has somehow has shown how in conjunction with the Enlightenment Rationalist Project, there are the political consequences of the colonial subjug subjugation by the West of other cultures and religion. For Assad, the political promise held out by the West for emancipation carries with it the religio-cultural significance of normalizing secularization as the proper mode by which religion ought to be practiced meaning the liberal strategy of containment, wherein religion is treated exclusively as a private matter of individual conscience. This reduction of religion to individual belief not only shows how religion has become increasingly marginalized in the modern world, but also betrays the covert theological bias that continues to exist within the field of the study of religion. Namely, that the academic treatment of religious belief is a modern, privatized Christian one. As Assad writes, quote, this modest view of religion, which would have horrified the early Christian fathers or medieval churchmen, is a product of the only legitimate space allowed to Christianity by post-enlightenment society, the right to individual belief." End quote. For Assad, behind the Western mandate of the separation of church and state rests a twin assumption that on the one hand associates modernization with secularization and on the other treats religion as an exclusively private, individual affair of personal conscience. As he writes, this is at once part of the strategy for secular liberals of the confinement and for liberal Christians of the defense of religion. And further, that this separation of religion from power is a modern Western norm, the product of a unique post-Reformation history. The attempt to understand Muslim traditions, for instance, by insisting that in them religion and politics are coupled must, in my view, lead to failure. But for me, it's perhaps Vadimo who's most helpful in showing the ways by which radical theology is opposed to secular theology. For Vadimo, secularization is a process of desacralization. Secularization is a process of desacralization that establishes the contemporary cultural conditions through which today's religions might have meaning. This is in accordance with his reading of the history of philosophy as the weakening of being. In this sense, the postmodern return of religion is very much a post-secular religiosity by virtue of the fact that there is no longer a unified religious authority. In short, religious authority has been relativized or pluralized. And further for Vadimo, while he affirms this notion of the post-secular in terms of desacralization, he rejects any notion of desecularization. He affirms desacralization rejects the secularization. So it is a religiosity that lives only as a consequence of secularization. We can say with Vadimo that the post-secular is not a repudiation, a reversal of secularization, but is its historical and cultural consequence that requires us to take note of the persistence of religion. In the words of Hannes Joas, post-secular does not, doesn't express a sudden increase in religiosity after its epochal decrease but rather a change in mindset of those who previously felt justified in considering religions to be more abound 
Along with this, however, comes a changed public perception about religion together with revised politics about the proper role of religion within the public sphere. In summary then, those for whom secularization meant a diminishment of religious belief or the fading away of religion from the public's consciousness, clearly David Brooks' quip is correct. That was yesterday's incorrect vision of the future. But for others, for whom secularization refers to the altered epistemological, cultural, and political terrain in which religion is practiced, believed, and studied, even in the midst of today's post-secular world, these remain live questions that must be pursued. Therefore, when I posit the radical theology as post-secular, this should not be construed as a theology of secularism. That is not to say, that is to say, it does not for forecast the demise or insignificance of religion, nor does it dismantle old beliefs and advocate unbelief as the enlightened option. But make no mistake, by its effect of desacralization, a radical theology is an act of profanation. This is like what Sam Gill says of the impact J.C. Smith has had on the shaping of the field of religious studies. Gill contrasts Smith's approach to Mercia Eliade, who as an early comparative religion scholar sought to bring some objectivity to the comparative study of religion by its focus on the various manifestations of the sacred in what he called hierophanies. While Eliade's religious categories were meant to be non-theological and religiously neutral terms in the words of Gill, they in fact stem from an essentialist presumption that did little more than disguise their theological character. Smith's approach, by contrast, proceeds from no essential structures that define religion, but rather from the conviction that religion is a mode of creating meaning. So for Gill, the academic study of religion demands the removal of the sacred from the temple, or at least the examination of the temple and what takes place inside the temple from the perspective of the world outside. As historians of religion have acknowledged their outsider status, so too does radical theology accept its outsider status. Whereas the history of religions removes the sacred from the temple, radical theology is removed from the church. Indeed, radical theology faces a double exile. It has replaced theology that has been displaced from its original home within an ecclesiastical context in service to the church. This means that it is independent of and not answerable to religious authority. Nevertheless, there remains a certain suspicion, if not hostility, to the very idea of doing or even studying theology within an academic context. For instance, count, countless genealogies of the academic field of religious studies have suggested that the making of religious studies as a legitimate and respectable member of the academy requires it to purge it of its theological residue. In this way, in a state of double exile, radical theology is simultaneously a profanation of ecclesiastical confessional theologies and a profanation of religious studies that is, as it is currently constituted. In sum, to say that radical theology is post-secular is to acknowledge the secularizing effect on what it means to think theologically. That is to say, the ways by which theology has been desacralized and profaned. Invoking the spirit of Tillich, it is no more atheistic than it is theistic. After all, as Vadimo said, the death of God liquidates the philosophical basis of atheism. Likewise, it also resists the opposition between the secular and the religious. The post-secular sensibility reminds us that religion persists even as it morphs, even as it changes. And in radical theology of the future looks as much for what religion is becoming or how it is changing as it does for what it once was. Number two, radical theology is post-liberal with a difference. The difference here must be specified in at least two different registers. First, by post-liberal, I do not mean to conjoin radical theology with the post-liberal Neobartian school of theology associated with Hans Frey, George Limbeck, Stanley Hauerwas, and others. Radical theology is neither neo-traditional nor confessional. Indeed, this is the main point of differentiation for Caputo's radical theology. Namely, the distinction between confessional theology, as he calls it, and a circumfessional theology. The former of which actually exists as the concrete expression of existing religious communities, and the latter of which insists as a demand of thought responsible to the event harbored within the name of God. As Caputo explains, quote, I start with confessional theology while trying to expose it, to expose myself to its own excess, to hold us all open to the event. 
As such, it is a theology under erasure, or as otherwise known, it is a weak theology. Second, by post-liberal, I do not mean a repudiation of liberal theology. Instead, I mean to mark a particular lineage of thought that grows out of the liberal tradition, but nevertheless can and should be distinguished from it. Radical, the radical theology history is a relatively brief one, as I understand it, beginning in the post-World War II years in a time of considerable angst and upheaval. Essentially simultaneous with the non-aligned movement committed to the political task of decolonization that functioned as an external dismantling of Western hegemony, Death of God theology developed as an internal movement within the West functioning as an imminent critique. For some, this was equivalent to a post-Christian era as the moral metaphysical God of the West had been revealed as a false idol bequeathing a legacy of xenophobia, misogyny, and genocidal violence. For others, the death of God was taken less as a cultural moment in time and more as a metaphysical truth and thereby announced as the gospel of Christian atheism. And this latter point is what was developed by Thomas Altizer. At its most basic for me, radical theology was born when Dietrich Bonhoeffer's prison cell writings with Bonhoeffer's prison cell writings, wherein he issued the challenge to live in a world without the working hypothesis of God. This is a world come of age, he said, and represents a distinctly post-liberal sensibility and that, like Bart before him, Bonhoeffer totally repudiated the cultural form of religion that was the great achievement of the likes of Kant, Hegel, and Schleiermacher in their efforts to salvage religion from the Enlightenment critiques. Bonhoeffer's call for a religion-less Christianity sets the template for radical theology self-distancing from religion. From this perspective, it is easy to see the continuity between Bonhoeffer and Caputo, whose reading of Derrida's religion without religion represents just a variation on a theme. There's one thing, there's one other meaning to the term post-liberal which I'd like to suggest. Shifting registers a bit, how much time do I have? Am I, am I okay? Okay, then I'll belabor this point. All right, so the other sort of point about sort of post-liberal. Shifting registers a bit, by the term liberal, I'm less concerned here with the tradition of liberal theology per se than I am with modern liberalism writ large. It is on this point where the work of the constitutional law professor Paul Kahn has been instructive for me. Kahn's done a lot of work on Carl Schmitt and political theology in particular. Kahn distinguishes between the legal and the political to make the point that there is no liberal concept of the political. There is no liberal concept of the political. What he means by this is that modern liberal political philosophy concerns itself almost exclusively with the rule of law, wherein the idea or the ideal of justice is reduced to equality under the law. Think here of John Rawls's veil of ignorance. The law equalizes and normalizes. The problem with this is not only that by the ever expansive reign of law, there is less and less room for the exercise of sovereignty, or more specifically, the sovereign decision, but more fundamentally, the legal rule does not match our actual political ethos. That is, we say one thing, but do another. Reason does not match the will. Kahn imagines political theology as a kind of phenomenology of actuality. What separates political theology from the normative liberal political philosophy is the attention it pays to sacrifice. This is, these are Kahn's questions. For what or to whom are we willing to lay down our lives? What are the bonds of affection or the stakes of claim on our identity such that we are willing to kill or die? It is one thing to follow the law when there is no perceived existential threat, but what are we willing to do when our survival the survival of our loved ones or the survival of our nation is at stake. Or better, not just what are we willing to do, but what have we done? What are we doing right now? What do we do over and over again? And why is it that the prevailing political philosophy provides no good account for how this fits within our supposed democratic constitutional order, wherein we pretend that the will has been subordinated to reason and violence has been brought under the rule of law? And the example that Kahn gives is the sort of reality of torture in a post-9-11 world. Uh, that liberal political philosophy is unable to account for that. The law is unable to account for it. But yet, it happens. 
Um, and we accept the fact that it happens. So we need to expand our political philosophy such that it sort of accounts for these kind of realities that we sort of know full well exist. It's not a, a normative philosophy in the sense of sort of defending it, but it is saying that we need to be able to sort of like expand, understand sort of the dynamics at work that allow this to happen. Um, so this is not, but it's not just that modern liberal the theory is inadequate, even more for Kant's unstable, in the sense that it is an untenable effort to avoid decision. As Kant explains it, quote, this is a little long quote. Liberalism fails to comprehend the nature of the political because it is committed to an ideal of agreement, first on the rules and then on the application. In a world in which everyone agrees, there is no need for a sovereign voice. Liberalism, accordingly, has no place for the concept of the sovereign. Without the sovereign, however, there can be no decision. Without the decision, no exception. And without the exception, we never reach the phenomena of the political. So like Kahn's transcendental critique of liberalism, my critique of radical theology is an effort to both draw and push against its own limits. My point is not that radical theology has somehow been complicit with regimes of power. This in spite of the fact that it has operated almost entirely within the providence of a largely Western and Christian discourse, and it has largely neglected the potential alliances between feminist, liberationist, and process thinkers. Instead, my critique has been that it has been ineffectual, not lacking in reason, but will. This critique is consistent with the standard academic narrative of the movement, but with, but with a difference. There is little debate over the fact that radical theology has been marginalized and obscured. But what I want to suggest is that it is possible to make a virtue out of this necessity. This is the importance of the rhetorical strategy adopted by the late postmodern theologian, Charles Winquist, who is my teacher, when he identifies theology as a minor intensive use of a major discourse. Pushing Winquist even further, this rhetorical strategy must be identified as a point of resistance. Radical theology is not a form of play for personal edification, not the soteriological drama in another register, but a willful political act of creative destruction. It is post-liberal in that it rejects the modern liberal separation of powers that renders religion merely as a cultural artifact or as a matter of individual personal conscience. In short, radical theology is post-liberal insofar as it is a political theology. And going one step further, it is a political theology insofar as it makes a decision by giving expression to its own preferential option and invoking liberation theology there. So number three, radical theology is a political theology or a liberation theology with a difference. The critique of radical theology that I've developed elsewhere is that it has been insufficiently political and further that there is no truly radical political theology. This concern has been mitigated in recent years both by those who self-identify with the radical theological lineage and by the widespread theological, theoretical attention to political theology and those concerned with the legacy of Carl Schmitt in particular. But by far the most effective and far-ranging theopolitical intervention has been that of liberation theology. And it has been certain feminist theologians and queer theorists who have, been best, who have best worked at the crossroads of radical theology and liberation theology. While the lineage of radical theologians I have invoked throughout have largely neglected liberationist thought, pioneering figures such as Mary Daly and Rosemary Radford Ruther have long drank from both wells. Consider especially Ruther's work from 1970, The Radical Kingdom, in which she affirms and unleashes the revolutionary ideology that runs from the Radical Reformation through the death of God, civil rights, black power, and anarchist movements of the 20th century. This is a tour de force. Make no mistake, by a probing critique of all forms of hierarchy, patriarchy, and violence, this is a feminist theology that is a radical theology. And even more, this radical feminist theology demonstrates not only the possibility, but also the efficacy, I never can say that word right, of a radical political theology. Likewise with the work of Marcella Altas Reed. She has invoked the roots of liberation theology as a dynamic theology that once embraced the hermeneutics of suspicion. But when it comes to issues of sexuality and family norms, it has been seized by a kind of orthodoxy. Interestingly, according to Althaus Reed, this, this sort of heterosexual norm is not a reflection of the views or priorities of the base ecclesiastical communities, the urban poor, 
and those who have been excluded from church discourses for centuries, but instead it is a product of academic colonization on the part of Euro-American scholars. She claims a kind of closet liberation theology developed at the fringes of the churches that has been closer to popular Latin American spirituality and culture than the orthodox liberationist discourses. This closet theology is a radical theology of kenosis, so radical in fact that it is not only emptied of ideological methodologies, and its message is not only fundamentally altered, but it also runs the risk of its own death. What Althaus Reed shows is a liberation theology that puts its own difference at the center of its critique and renewal. As such, it is a liberation theology with a difference. In addition to these figures, I believe that the work of Catherine Malibu also has important repercussions. When I cite Malibu as a principal resource for a radical theology of the future, I want to suggest that the repercussions for a new species of liberation theology can sort of emerge from her work. We see her, for instance, achieving a rehabilitation of the word essence in her discussion of sexuality and gender. It is a critique, albeit a sympathetic one, of the social constructivism of queer theory, whereby the ties between biology and identity have been absolutely severed. It is a refusal of the distinctions between mind and brain that rests in her fundamental ontology of change. <coughs> Malibu represents a new and different kind of radicality by insistence that there is something more fundamental than identity and difference. This means by her recognition, by her reckoning that revolutionary emancipatory change is achieved not by a politics of identity, but first and more basically by the recognition that before the difference of identity comes the change of being, being qua change, the change that happens by which each and every being always and already becomes different from itself, always different. This is a different difference than that of Derridian difference because it is a difference predicated on change. For Malibu, difference does not operate as a transcendental concept, nor as a quasi-transcendental concept. Instead, it is derived, it's produced, it's secondary. Difference is displaced by change. The really real is change by, which, by virtue of which differences happen. Likewise, it is a different difference than that which has animated the politics of identity, and also different from Althaus Reed's, Reed's indecent theology. This puts the moral, political, theological, and philosophical critiques of essence into critical relief. What is it about essence? And think about this, the kind of the, the critique offered by sort of feminist uh, theologians especially. What is it about essence which we rightly object to? When employed in discussions of sexuality and gender or with race, the problem with talk of essence is that it implies, it is associated with, and it is employed towards the end of a fixed essence, a naturalization of social norms, an ideological construction that then provides the rationalization of and script for continuing prejudice and oppression. But what if, in contrast to this fixed notion of essence, essence is thought of in plastic terms, the differences would be no less real, even no less material or biological. Even while being recognized as a product of our own making, differences have a history, a heritage, differences matter, and while real, biological, material, that would need not imply that we are stuck in or with these differences, captive to this history, stuck in a perpetuation of the same. Because just as before difference comes change, change never stops without beginning or end, a metabolic ontology that just might be the basis of a new and different liberation thinking, liberationist theology. This is the radical political theology I have in mind. Its merit, as I see it, is a more robust political ontology. This would be a political becoming of radical theology that does not eschew ontology for its tendency at totalizing or essentializing, but instead recognizes in being the very nature of change and resistance. As such, it would be a revolution for both radical theology and liberation theology alike. And fourth and finally, radical theology is ontotheological with a difference. I'm going to get myself in trouble with this. <laughs> At least since his short, but I'm going to invoke sort of Caputo to my cause, whether he likes it or not. At least since his short instruction, instructional text, Philosophy and Theology, Caputo has sought to bring philosophy and theology together. He advises thinking the two as, quote, different acts or modes of thinking as two different dimensions of a whole human life that can happily and productively coexist. <laughs> 
By holding to do the two together, it yields thinking believers or believing thinkers, people of learning and faith. A happy marriage. At least since the time of Heidegger and his highly influential critique of the so-called problem of Vanto theology, this mixing of discourses has been the exception rather than the rule. For the most part, philosophers and theologians following the wake of Heidegger have wittingly or unwittingly accepted his prescriptive analysis that philosophy and theology make two, along with the consequent assertion that there can be no Christian philosophy or no philosophical theology. That to write a theology, the word being should not appear. That Christian philosophy is nothing but a square circle or a round square. I forget which one it is. Given this Heideggerian legacy, I do not want to diminish the significance of Caputo's breaching of the divide between philosophy and theology. In Heidegger's insistence on treating philosophy and theology as two separate and distinct discourses, this has been one of the most unfortunate consequences of the identification and analysis of the problem of onto theology, if you ask me. But as I have also tried to demonstrate elsewhere, holding philosophy and theology together gets us only part way to the more fundamental task, which is the rethinking of the ontotheological condition itself. While much of contemporary philosophical theology has been preoccupied, if not consumed, by the task of overcoming ontotheology, theology might become more radical by thinking ontotheology otherwise, by embracing rather than resisting the ontotheological dimension of thought. And I realize this is heresy to some. And this is where, for me, Malibu's work fits in. In short, beyond radical theology's almost exclusive identification with the death of God comes Malibu's profession. God is not dead, God is plastic. As I've argued, the identification and analysis of the problem of ontotheology belies a quest for purity. In the place of this, I suggest miscegenation and metamorphosis as two images of the reject that might help to reclaim the ontotheological condition of thought. Ontotheology is a mixed discourse. It recognizes the ethico-political significance of thinking on the border. Thinking ontotheologically is a rejected way of thinking that nevertheless gives birth not so much to something new as to something old, something impure. A miscegenated form of thought does not reject the reject, but instead it rejects the misguided quest for purity and the task of overcoming. Likewise with metamorphosis. The traditional reading of the problem of ontotheology is concerned with how it establishes an artificial limit. From the beginning to end and from the ground up, the identification of God with being is complete, a totalizing gesture that renders human history as irrelevant if not dead on arrival. God is established as the eternal norm for which there can be no deviation. As such, ontotheology is the ultimate alienation. Liberation is predicated on an impossible infinitude because change is considered a violation of the natural order. This is by the standard reading of Ontotheology. theology. And it is a fundamental self-contradiction. Radical eminence betrays a secret desire for transcendence because the being of God is a God beyond God and the God beyond being. But what if, as Malibu insists, there can be, quote, radical transformation without exoticism. If God is plastic, then not only is God changed, but God makes change and God changes. So given the cause for concern that identifies onto theology as a problem is eliminated. Metamorphosis does not represent the absurdist trage tragedy suggested by Kafka, but it is the secret agent by which we might come to know better the nature of reality, the imminent possibility for change and the power of resistance. By embracing the ontotheological condition of thought, which in this case means accepting miscegenation and metamorphosis as appropriate figures for theological thought, then radical theology might get beyond questions of identity and difference or the territorial disputes so endemic to the academic industrial complex. Purity emits the stench of otherworldliness. It also is haunted by the specter of God as the graven image of white male normativity. This is the stillborn, moral metaphysical God who is dead. Exposing the idolatry inherent in this form of onto theology has been the critical task of radical death of God theology heretofore. Miscegenation and metaphor, metamorphosis are bolder still. Affirming the divine and the impure, the polluted, the reject, and the flux. 
Beyond and before the pearly gates is the dirt and dirtiness of material flesh. From dust to dust, and so it is with God. Thank you. The relationship of um, liberation theology and radical theology, because as I see it, there is kind of a liberationist impulse in radical theology that is often overlooked. So maybe you can speak to that just for a minute. Okay. Because I was really yeah. interested in that. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I've uh, got myself in trouble for a footnote I once wrote um, when I was first making a, uh, my initial foray into political theology, in which I was I was trying to articulate a critique of radical theology that it had not sort of really engaged the work of, of feminist or liberationist thinkers in the past. But then I sort of went sort of one step further and, and suggested that. Um, that liberation theology and sort of process theology were insufficiently radical. And what I meant by that at, at the time, and I've, I've since sort of uh, reconsidered this position, was that um, liberation theology sort of had a, a kind of radical form of political engagement and social analysis, certainly. Um, it's the reason why, you know, church hierarchy sort of uh, rejected it and sort of effectively stamped it out, right? Um, because of its sort of Marxist overtones. But when it came to its, its uh, religious teachings, um, it sort of remained kind of safely within the fold of traditional Christian doctrine. Um, it sort of applied that sort of to this kind of radical sort of revolutionary social analysis. But it didn't allow that to then kind of reflect back on sort of what that means for rethinking the conditions of possibility for theological thinking. Um, so that's what I meant at the time. Um, and and I, and I think part of that is true, and there's a, sort of one thinker in particular who is very influential for me, Alistair Key, who kind of makes this argument sort of much more extensively than, than I. But um, so the problem with making that sort of absolute declaration is that I had not sort of read nearly as widely in sort of liberationist thought that I should have. Um, I mean, it was sort of early in my sort of seminary education. I sort of had some minimal exposure to it and sort of made some general absolute claims sort of based on that. Um, and so after sort of being called to task for, for that footnote that then subsequently became sort of the basis of a kind of a, a couple of publications, um, both from myself and I'll put the blame on Clayton Crockett. Um, what we did, uh, what I've done sort of since then is sort of take a, a look at sort of how precisely sort of liberationist the, uh, theologians have, have sort of asked this question of, of how do we think theologically differently like, as a consequence of these kind of concrete uh, political and social concerns. And I think Althaus Reed is the perfect example that so see, she subjects sort of theology to its own kind of dissolution and death every bit as much as any death of God theologian has done. Um, so I think instead of cutting that conversation off and sort of declaring it sort of more of one, um, what I'm trying to do now is sort of open it up and just sort of um, figure out ways in which these can be sort of mutually enriching. Um, I certainly think it sort of breathes new life into radical theology, which has been insufficiently political in my view. Uh, but, I, but I also think it can provide a kind of new theoretical kind of orientation for how to do liberation theology. And for me, that's where Malachi sits in. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, sir. I'll let me read the mic to you. Awesome. It's like, let's make a deal. Hi. Thanks very much. Um, the fourth thesis, uh, that God is onto theological uh, strikes me as quite provocative. And I simply ask uh, if you could elaborate on what you mean. And I also am not familiar with the author you were citing in Malibu. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, uh, God is plastic? <laughs> yeah, if you could just simply elaborate on what, what you were getting at. Yeah. Um, this is, I'm, I'm sort of revisiting all of the mistakes I made in the past. Um, because uh, my first book was called Between Faith and Thought, an essay on the ontotheological condition, in which I um, tried, I, I sort of looked at both um, Heidegger and Barth specifically as kind of setting a template that 20th century philosophers and theologians kind of wittingly or unwittingly followed 
that sort of you know, wittingly or unwittingly kept philosophy separate from theology. And I think sort of did a disservice to both as a consequence of that. Um, and so, I, you know, through sort of an engagement with sort of figures like Ricoeur and Levinas and Derrida, ultimately I try at the, at the end to try to kind of break down that kind of artificial division, um, show how these things can sort of be mutually enhancing. Um, and in some ways, if you sort of look at sort of Derrida's work, almost every time he sort of talks about theology, he's talking about the problem of onto theology, and he resists that that kind of designation for his work. Sort of, um, I'll get myself in trouble. I mean, I think sort of if you look at sort of Jack's early work, um, he it was a long time before he came out as a theologian as he says in Weakness of God. I'm looking for him to nod, but he's not nodding right now. <laughs> but he says that. So it's a, lo- it's a long time before he comes out as a theologian because theology has this sort of bad association to it. Um, sort of theology is, is sort of, as Heidegger said, it's, it's, it's a closed form of thinking. It's not open and it's not genuine thought. Right. So I, I, I tried to sort of break that down. I tried to sort of say that there's a different way of thinking about theology. Um, and it's not that I sort of disown that or anything like that, but, but it wasn't until I really um, studied the work of Catherine Malibu, who was a student of Derrida's, that I, I felt like I was able to kind of develop a kind of, a kind of understanding of being that really allows one to sort of rethink the problem of onto theology. And, and it, it, the same sort of um, logic applies to liberation theology as it does to the problem of onto theology. So again, sort of the way I put it in the paper, what is it about the problem of um, essence sort of for social constructivists, someone like Judith Butler, let's say, What is it about sort of talk of essence that they object to so much? And the problem with essence is that it's thought of as being fixed. It's this kind of ideological sort of social construction that then becomes naturalized, right? And so if you think about essence in plastic terms, that is that it sort of is is capable of changing, sort of taking on different forms, uh, sort of reforming and deforming itself, then essence is no longer the bugaboo that it was before. Um, essence, essence, sort of uh, changing, sort of essence can can allow you to sort of relink what had become delinked between sort of biology and culture, or nature and culture, and you're not stuck with the kind of ideological prescription of social norms that the social constructivist object to in the first place. Does that make sense so far? Okay. So then the second part with onto theology, same kind of thing. What's the problem with with onto theology, sort of, if, if one sort of thinks of being in static terms, then sort of once you identify God with being in static terms, then you've got this kind of, in some ways, kind of artificial limit in which you're sort of claiming to know both sort of the ground of God's existence and sort of the height. Um, and, and so this becomes a kind of total eminence that's totalizing, not just essentializing, but totalizing. But if you're able to sort of think of being again in terms of change and plasticity, then um, one can sort of relink what had become delinked. Heidegger says if he were to write a theology, the word being would not appear. The reason is because sort of God is sort of you know, structurally unknowable, sort of factually unknown, that kind of stuff. But sort of now you can sort of think about sort of being and sort of God with respect to sort of changing essence. Um, a kind of metabolic ontology is the way Malibu talks about it. And so the kind of problems associated with onto theology being this kind of totalizing sort of imminence um, it can be disrupted, um, sort of broken open a bit um, because of the kind of flux that's introduced with the word being. Hopefully that makes sense. And so this is, um, this is just a kind of suggestion that that yes, so the problem of onto theology is definitely a problem so long as one accepts the kind of Heideggerian critique, and that sort of implies sort of accepting a certain reading of Heidegger on the question of being. But once you sort of rethink the question of being uh, in, in plastic terms, that sort of leads to a totally different analysis of the so-called problem of onto theology, in which maybe it's not even a problem anymore. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, 
just a reminder that Jeff will be part of the panel also. So if you have more questions, uh, we'll have a question answered during that too. After you have sandwiches and beer, I think is the point. Uh, so, uh, and by the way, uh, Jake here, if you don't know him, he did a lot of work to organize this. So during the break, shake his hand, say thank you. Done a fantastic job, honestly. 